All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 17th of June in the year of our Lord, 2022. Now, the scripture declares that the love of money is a root of many evils. And if you want to corrupt yourself, pursue money. It will do it. In fact, it will tend to take over your life if you're not careful. If you are not, the world will mold you into its own image. If you are not grounded in Jesus Christ, if you are not resting on the built upon the foundation of the rock, Christ himself, well, the, the flood of iniquity will sweep you away. Just like the Yellowstone River has swept away much up there. While down in the southwest, they seem to be having a, a dry spell as Lake Mead is getting close to no pump mark. Wow. So um, you have to think biblically about this stuff. Global warming. Okay, there, climate change. There is what people don't understand. Well, first of all, the world's not going to admit it anyway because they do not believe God. But the scripture is clear. God warns his people, Israel, that if they engage in the sins that uh, the people that God drove out of the land there in the Middle East, in what now is called the land of Israel, uh, that, that the, they would be driven out too. And he, he mentions abominations like bestiality and some other things and homosexuality. And he says if, because the, the people that were there were practicing these things, and because of that, God removed them. God removed them. Drove them out. And God says to, to warning his people, if you practice these things, the land itself will vomit you out. So nature, according to the scriptures, apparently, nature itself reacts to the wickedness of of man, creation itself. Of course, man was created to be the the pinnacle of creation and uh, have dominion over it, especially the earth. And apparently, creation you can't. T you know, the fact when when man is rebellion, uh, when man is in rebellion against God, uh, that has a negative effect in creation because man was supposed to to shape creation and take care of creation. And instead, he abuses everything. So the create when when, when creation uh, is se is being abused by what is supposed to be the temple of God, the presence of God in man, caring for it. At some point, apparently, creation itself uh, gets sick and pukes people out, sort of a uh, immune response, you might say, to the infection of sinners. But that's, so when we see some of these things, and the scriptures talk about violent weather, the roaring of seas, and other things in the last days, that men's hearts will be failing them for fear for what they see coming on the earth. So we can expect some turbulence in the weather, but it's not caused by CO2. It's caused by sin. Now, speaking of sin and evangelicals, and this is what really, the love of money, how it corrupts everything. Once you go down that path, so many, I've noticed 
so many websites that used to be very useful or often useful in revealing different problems uh, corrupted themselves. And now, you know, they seem to be more about uh, money than they do about what they originally did. Uh, ben Shapiro, uh, Matt Walsh, uh, The Daily Wire. It seems that, okay, uh, Matt Walsh did just did a movie, apparently. You can see it online. If you join the club, the Daily Wire Club, it's like $12 a month, paid annually. So if you'll pluck down your $144 for a year's subscription, you can watch this movie, What is a Woman? Now, it's out in book form, but you can't buy the video, apparently, on Amazon or something. Uh, but that there is a trailer available. You can watch the trailer. And apparently it's, it's uh, well, largely Matt Walsh mocking the confused gender movement <laughs> uh, over... Uh, the issue of uh, they themselves can't define what a woman is. Well, that's part of the problem. That's existentialism run amok. Well, existentialism is godlessness run amok. It is the uh, the logical result of 19, uh, 1776 and the American revolution against God. Oh, my. It's just, you know, if you look at that, if you think biblically about it, you know what the Scripture says. You know what God says happens when you reject, walk away from him. You reject the knowledge of God. So it's a logical outcome. It can't go any other way. I mean, there might, where there might be differences in, in ends and time frames and the exact manifestations, because I believe the next nation to follow the American example was France, the French Revolution. If you want to see sin run amok, it's there. The only difference between America and the French Revolution was America was a Protestant country and the French were Roman Catholics. If you want to look nearer, the American Revolution spread throughout the Americas. Except for Canada. Canada is a lone holdout. But all through Latin America, they took up the cause of revolution following the American example and overthrew their governments, overthrew the Spanish and occasionally the French. <laughs> but see, look, at the his, look at the political history of Mexico. Talk about a confused mess. They, they had to overthrow both the Spanish and the French. And they've had periodic revolutions. I don't know how many independence days they have in Mexico. <laughs> it's confusing. And off, But often the Mexican government, to this very day, has had a decided hostility toward religion, uh, Christianity, and especially Roman Catholicism. Well, there's a reason for that, but because the Roman Catholic uh, Church had so dominated that world controlled everything in Europe uh, Roman Catholicism owned most of the land had accumulated it over the millennia uh, through gifts and they uh, leased it out and they heavily taxed the population you had to pay tithes on everything to the church it was a well it was a scam it was a scam because, and then they invented these doctrines like uh, transubstantiation and outside the church there is no salvation, which is a truism, but their definition of the truth is of the church is false. And they basically held the population not at gunpoint, but on the edge of hell saying, you don't obey us, we toss you in. Scam scam. That's what fallen humanity does. That's sinful people. And, you know, like the papacy, it's always been dominated by sinful people. That's, and today it's dominated, the Catholic uh, hierarchy and clergy is dominated by homosexuality, according to Roman Catholics, including Archbishop uh, Vigano. 
he called uh, the Vatican a homo the, the, the in other words the organization there a homosexual mafia the 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 capital of the church the self-proclaimed church once upon a time there was a real church in Rome there still are real real churches in the city but Rome is not one of them but I've noticed that uh, like church militant which is um, conservative Catholics including um, led by a professional journalist has become more and more monetized just like uh, Daily Wire they they uh, part of it's out of fear of social media so the the censorship on YouTube and other sites Facebook uh, Twitter whatever has served to corrupt organizations both conservative and uh, Christian <coughs> because they have to look to other venues and they don't know how to do things without money they don't have a connection to God to say Lord how should we do this in a way that honors you and doesn't put a burden on those that, see uh, did Jesus monetize his ministry okay well it says I was thinking about that again you can uh, the uh, movie uh, what is a woman is available online but you have to subscribe to the Daily Wire annually it's twelve dollars a month I believe but it's an annual payment so they want your $144 up front to be able to see this movie. Huh. Now, now of course, Ben Shapiro is not a Christian. <clears throat> so I'll cut him a little slack. He's just a sinner. And a lawyer. Like, uh, maybe I won't cut him any slack. But, I mean, he does not, he's not... He does not recognize the lordship of Jesus Christ, of Yeshua HaMashiach, the Messiah, who was born of the tribe of Judah. Not only the Jewish Messiah, but the Messiah of the whole world. Now, he doesn't recognize him, so he's a rebel against Christ, against God himself. He's an orthodox, which means rabbinical, follows rabbinical Judaism. Uh, Christianity has certain things in common with that, but basically the Old Testament, but rabbinical Judaism doesn't follow the Old Testament. <laughs> what we have in common, well, the rabbinical Judaism, cons uh, conserv I, I can't say conservative Ju Judaism because there's a branch of Judaism called conservative Judaism and reform Judaism. But uh, Orthodox Judaism is rabbinical. It follows the Talmud, yeah. no, which it, and they are the descendants of the Pharisees of the New Testament. Anyway, side issue, but cr especially Christians that are corrupted by this. Uh, J.D. Hall, who has or had... Uh, it's sort of been put on the back burner, a website called Pulpit and Pen. Uh, it basically started in his church office out there someplace in Montana, on the western edge, I believe, and would do blogs or podcasts, uh, mostly on YouTube and on Facebook, until he pretty much got booted, and then he rebranded himself as Protestia. And then he got a sidekick. He he got he started hiring people, hiring private investigators, and J.D. Hall has certain problems with things himself, and he has a habit of getting himself in serious trouble. And I guess he's in the middle of a lawsuit now, and he's he's currently resting in absentia. Or hiding, I'm not sure which. But then he got also got deeply into Montana politics. He lost interest in the gospel mostly and went over and started a conservative online newspaper in Montana. No. He talk about mission creep. No, this is loss of mission when he do that. 
Uh, he, his church was part of the Southern Baptist Convention, probably a church plant. And then he broke away a couple of years ago because he realized, well, they're bad. Southern Baptist is bad. It's, it's worldly, corrupt. And anyway, there. So I, I hadn't looked at SBC for a while, or, or the, the uh, protest. Yeah, the SBC just finished their, their uh, 2022 convention. And there was an incident there where apparently somebody wanted to boot Rick Warren out of the convention. That ain't going to happen. No way, Jose. Uh, because he has, uh, what's the word? He has basically appointed his own su successor. And it's a younger man and his wife as successors to Rick Warren at Rick Warren's Saddleback Church. Now, and apparently the wife will be like a co-minister. Now, the Southern Baptists historically do not allow women to serve as uh, pastors. Uh, sort of. But really, the convention has no authority over that. Con the, the, it's not a denomination, but they're sure trying to be one. They are sure trying to uh, exercise authority over local churches. They really don't have it. It's just a missionary outfit or a group of uh, what they call entities, missionaries and uh, educational and publishing, things like that, that are um, co or what What do you call it outside of the church, uh, parachurch uh, ministries. They have no authority over the local churches, but they're, they're trying to, of course, the lust to power. The love of power. If I can't have money, I want power. Well, power, money is just power. It's just a form of power, a particular form. But uh, as so, I went over to protest you. I haven't visited them for a while, and uh, here they are. This is JD Hall's sidekick, who fills in for him more and more often. But he. He was commenting on Rick Warren. Apparently, Rick Warren made an appearance at the convention and uh, uh, made an appeal that his church not be booted from the SBC. They're never going to kick Rick Warren's church out. He, he is the quintessential Southern Baptist, thoroughly conformed to the world and desiring to conform the church to the world also. Reduce the gospel to saying a stupid little prayer that doesn't mean anything. Just re it's re reduce salvation to one paragraph in his book, The Purpose Driven Life. See, that book is all about you and your happiness. It's not about God and God's will. And Rick Warren uses every translation of the Bible he can imagine, especially the most bizarre ones, because he simply uses it to try to find a passage in some translation that sounds somewhat like what he's trying to say, takes it out of context and uses it, uses the Word of God. Well, sometimes it's so corrupted by the translation you can't even tell it. You can't even recognize it as being part of the Bible. I, I When I looked in his book, I had to actually look in the... Uh, he has the uh, the references way back at the back of the book. Uh, so I had to go back there and say, what translation did he use? Because I couldn't even recognize the Scripture as, as being part of the Scripture. It's like, wow. But it was simply, that's simply to give, to give, falsely give authority to Rick Warren's message, which is simply give the sinners what they want. Fill the church. Don't care how you do it. Just give them what they want. If they want country music, give them country music. If they want uh, uh, rock and roll, give them rock and roll. If they want 20-minute sermons or 5-minute sermons, give them what they want, whatever it takes to get them to come to church, as if going to church is salvation. See, Rick Warren has no idea what the church is or what salvation is. He's a quintessential Southern Baptist. But anyway, there's this gentleman uh, at uh, Protestia uh, 
commented somewhat on this. Uh, actually, they, they ripped off the title from, I think, the Christian Post or something like that. Uh, Rick Warren urges the SBC, or uh, what does it say? Re or Warren rebukes the SBC for daring to remove his church over ordaining women. Well, the SBC didn't actually do that. But there's nothing like soundbiting something in order to get you to look at it. Corruption. It's corruption. Can you imagine Jesus Christ doing that? Can you imagine Jesus Christ monetizing his ministry? There is no record in Scripture of Jesus Christ ever taking an offering. Now, he received offerings. People voluntarily donated to his ministry, including some apparently wealthy women. But Jesus Christ didn't ask for money. There's no record of him ever asking for money. Of course, if you can feed 5,000 with uh, two loaves of bre bread and five small fishes, or was it the other way around? Two small fishes and five loaves of five little uh, muffins or biscuits, basically. You, you basically you could multiply money, couldn't you? Now, what does he say that you cannot serve God and money? But a lot of evangelicalism has corrupted itself and others serving money. Uh, when I had the bookstore, I it was. I could hardly find any books that were sound enough, in my opinion, to put on the shelf. And the classics, like, say, Pilgrim's Progress, which is a classic not only of uh, Christian literature, but of English literature. The, after the Bible, the most printed book, English book in history. John Bunyan, famous, um, what would be the correct word? Baptist, Shepherdist? <sighs> Wrote Pilgrim's Progress. I, I, and people come in and you know, they, I so try, try to recommend it. And they never heard of it. Most people wanted something useless, something by Joel Osteen or Joyce Myers or the like, or worse, or worse. I had pastors calling up, asking for a book. And sometimes I'd go and check that book out, and I'd realize, you know, I'd look to see what it was. No way I'm going to order that. I mean, I tell them, you know, you have to get, you just order it online. He says, I, I wouldn't put it in a store. And it was uh, really a lost cause. And people, other than selling Bibles, and some of those, most of those I wouldn't sell either. They had to meet a standard of, of decency <laughs> in the sense that they had to be basically a literal translation. Occasionally, I think, I would order an NIV on request. But that's it. Because I don't think much of that either. It's not a, it's not reliable enough. And there's no reason. I mean, there's things like the the New King James. There's no reason to to use a paraphrase at all, other than you don't really want what God has said. You want something else, something other than what God has said, which is why people buy paraphrases. They're not easier to understand. It's just the paraphrases have so corrupted the Bible that you're generally not reading God's Word, and it's not going to bother you because it's been put in uh, friendly terms so often or mutilated. So, But anyway, this, uh, this is apparently a story partly about Rick Warren and his... He wasn't booted. This is clickbait. But there was a comment... And I want you to hear this comment. Supposedly this, this man here, is this young man, is going to present the real gospel as opposed to Rick Warren's purpose-driven pablum gospel. Sinner-sensitive gospel. 
So I want you to hear this. And uh, let's see. I have to mute my mic. And Rick Warren preaches a famously, now at this point it's been out long enough, a famously false gospel. Yes. And so before we discuss Rick Warren and his false gospel, we're going to discuss the true gospel. And the true gospel of Jesus Christ starts with bad news. And it's, it's, it's only bad news out of, outside of Christ, but bad news that you and I were born into sin. That's right. That's where the first thing missing from Rick Warren's false gospel is culpability for sin and the fact that you have offended a holy and righteous God with your sin. And therefore, oh, well, hold a minute here. You're, you're not born culpable. You're not. This is Augustinianism, where Adam's sin, Adam's guilt. See, the problem with Calvinism and Augustinian Catholicism. He's one of the fathers of the Roman Catholic Church. He's also the father of the Calvinist movement. The and Lutheranism too. Come to think of it, Luther was an Augustinian monk, and uh, Calvin certainly uh, relied on Augustine and Luther, but there's. Augustine, either directly or indirectly. But no, uh, Augustine believed that that Adam's sin, his act of rebellion, is r imputed to everyone. And this basically formed the justification for infant baptism, which really hadn't been established even in Augustine's day. The idea that you had to do something, the church had to remove that sin and that's and, and you were born with it so rather than risk it they baptize babies to remove the sin of adam well god does not impute guilt everyone dies for their own sin now people are born without righteousness in the, sen in the sense of positive good the presence of god in their life but they're not born without the revelation of god god gives light to everyone coming into the world so this is a an artifact of this is this guy's calvinist so there's a number of errors in that system major errors <laughs> For are deserving of eternal punishment and hellfire, which is what the Bible promises will happen to those who die outside of Christ. Uh, actually, in, in, if you're ignorant, you're, you're held accountable for what you know. That's the, the bad part that necessitates and really give part of what makes the gospel so wonderful and powerful is the consequences of not believing, the consequences of not being in Christ. So hell makes the gospel wonderful and powerful. Jesus put the emphasis somewhere else, although he did speak more about hell than anybody else. Uh, Jesus said God so loved the world, so loved I would say the cosmos, I would say, so God loved its creation so much that he sent his son into the world to save sinners because he loved them. Now, I don't remember the Bible ever saying that God's, uh, that the gospel is so wonderful because hell is so terrible. No, it's the, 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 what the gospel emphasizes, and Paul makes this very clear, is that Christ came into the world to save sinners. While we were yet, while still enemies, Christ died for us. Christ died for his enemies. Now, obviously, this man is, well, at least momentarily confused. <laughs> Maybe he's having a bad day. 
Well, if, if you were taking J.D. Hall's place, I'd say you're having a bad day. And what was God's answer? For those whom he has called according to his purpose, he sent his only son. Uh, see, uh, this is also Calvinism, limited atonement. Christ did not die for the sins of all humanity. Only for the elect. But that's not the biggest problem with it. This video is really not about Calvinism, but I, I have to comment on it. Jesus Christ to be born of a virgin and live a perfect life, earning righteousness on your behalf. That's it right there. Christ earning righteousness? He earned righteousness? Really? You mean he didn't come with righteousness? He came unrighteous and had to earn it? By the works of the law shall no flesh be justified in the sight of God. Now, Jesus did keep the law, but Jesus only maintained his righteousness. He didn't earn it. See, you can't earn anything under the law. Jesus, it, it just The law is the will of God. Jesus did the will of God. He kept the law. He was actually the one who sent the law, too. He is the word of God. But he also took the law out of the way. So that rather than being judged by the law, because Jesus paid the penalty of the law, as an innocent man, he yes, he lived an innocent life. He had to, to take the law off the judgment table. For those who believe in Christ, who trust in him, who trust in what he did for you, God has taken the law off the table because the wages of sin is death. To break the law is to bring the sentence of death on yourself. And Christ kept the law and yet offered himself as a sacrifice in your place, dying for you. So those who trust in him, he has canceled out the penalty of the law by nailing it to the cross for those who trust in him. For those who reject his salvation, well, then you get justice rather than grace and mercy. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. That is pretty thin in Calvinism. Which is why I can get sort of worked up about it. Because I was sort of drawn into it for a while. Saw it from the inside. So I have a, not simply a hostile viewpoint. I think God allowed that, that I might see that and warn others about it. But that's not what I want to, I don't want to spend all my time on Calvinism. But here, but the idea that, that Jesus earned righteousness? The law doesn't have anything for people that are on right to, to be to be to, if you earn righteousness that means you start from a position of unrighteous. Jesus maintained his righteousness. He maintained his obedience. You can't earn anything from the law. You can only maintain it's like God's blessing is God's grace. You, under the law, you can maintain that, theoretically. But you can't, the, uh, you cannot, there's nothing in the law, that, for example, that can uh, remove the guilt of deliberate sin. If you know, it can only remove, the sacrifices of the law can only atone for sins committed in ignorance. You didn't know that you had to do this or you couldn't do that. Then the animal sacrifices were, you know, supposedly removed it. But they, if you deliberately rebelled against God, there was no sacrifice for that. 
knowing what was God required and breaking it deliberately. No sacrifice. That's why Jesus, let me get away from protest you. Ah, this looks so much better. It can be so annoying. At one time, they were somewhat useful. This was back when it was pulpit and pen. Years ago, when J.D. Hall was just a pastor with a microphone in his study. Then he got went big time. And the love of money. Then he started monetizing everything. Now, advertising, putting ads in. And, and J.D. Hall has problems with understanding. Uh, supposedly, uh, <coughs> uh, problems related to, what do they call it? I don't know. Anyway, uh, if you point out some things, if you use some satire or something like that, it just doesn't work with him. He doesn't understand. He was running some uh, ads. Well, actually, there were Google ads on his site. And, of course, he didn't know what they were, but they were advertising uh, rather edgy T-shirts for women and sort of skimpy dress uh, wear uh, uh skimpy uh, clothing for some women and I pointed that out to look what and I was just basically mocking a little bit and he didn't get it he thought I I he didn't think I understood that those were just those were not ads he chose but I was just you know irritating him with it a little bit to, to try to rebuke him gently about his monetizing his website. But the issue is, did Jesus charge for his preaching? Does Jesus charge for the gospel? Well, in some churches he does. It's called tithing, which is under the Old Testament law. And if you and the preacher will preach, you have to tithe to be right with God. He's teaching that a, a preacher that does that is teaching a damning gospel because that's not the gospel at all. Salvation is a free gift. God doesn't charge ten percent for it. Joe Biden might, but for his stuff, but not God. It's free. You can't buy it. It's too costly anyway. The life of his son is too costly for you to purchase. What would you what would you pay God? But the idea that Jesus earned righteousness for you? Uh, that might just be simply a misspeaking, but it's certainly not true. Jesus didn't need to earn righteousness. He was righteous. He needed to remain sinless in order to be the sinless Lamb of God that gives his life for the sins of the world. An offering has to be free from blemish to give his life, an innocent life, for a guilty life, requires that he keep his life innocent. That's not earning righteousness. It's simply maintaining it. And he did that. And God counts those who trust in Christ as righteous because of their faith. Just as he, uh, he reckoned, he counted Abraham as righteous because God promised something to him that his descendants would be like the stars of the heavens and the sand of the sea. And Abraham believed God. And it was counted to him into righteousness, for righteousness. God looked at that and said, Abraham believes me. He's okay with me. Because God knew that Jesus Christ was going to take care of the sins that Abraham committed to. God looked forward. God had planned an offering, not of bulls and goats, but of his own son to die on a cross for the sins of the world. And because he died for the sins of the whole world, he opened the door to salvation to all would believe that salvation might be on the basis of faith and not of works. And that's the gospel that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. 
While we were yet sinners, enemies of God, Christ died for us. He didn't come and die for saints. He died to save sinners and to make them into saints through faith in Jesus Christ.